depending on which agency is, you you do it in different ways. You you stop the profiteering. FDA gets fifty percent of its budget from the pharmaceutical company. Of course, that's not going to work. NIH scientists should not be able to collect royalties on the, the revolving doors that, that amplify that put corporate capture on steroids. We have to get rid of those. A lot of this I can do with executive order. There's also in these agencies there are individuals at high levels who have corrupted them. And I'm not just talking about these agencies. I've said also the CIA. Mike Pompeo. I had, I had dinner with Mike Pompeo about four months ago in Las Vegas, and he said to me, um, he said, my one biggest regret in life is that I didn't clean up the CIA when I had a chance when I was running it, and he said, virtually the entire upper echelon of that agency are made up of individuals who do not believe in the, in the democratic institutions of the United States of America. Now, my daughter-in-law, Emerilis Fox Kennedy, who's running my campaign, spent her career as a clandestine agent for the CIA. She says, yeah, that's right, there's 29,000 people who are employed by that agency, and most of them are patriots and good public servants, but the upper echelons are controlled by uh, the military-industrial complex and people who would do its bidding. The same is true in NIH. When I sued um, Monsanto, when we sued Monsanto, we got discovery documents that showed that um, the head of the pesticide division at EPA for over a decade was a guy called Jess Rowland, who was secretly working for Monsanto the entire time. And he was taking his orders from the highest officials of Monsanto to kill studies, to fix studies, to hire these, bring in these phonies, mercenary scientists, we call them by us, to, to ghostwrite studies. And that he was the one that kept those studies. His job was to make sure no study got done that would look at the links between glyphosate and cancer. I can tell you who those individuals are at CDC. Colleen Boyle, Frank Stefano. I know the names because I've dealt with them. I know who has to be moved. And, but, but, and, you know, President Trump wanted to do this. President Trump came in and said, I'm going to drain the swamp. But he didn't know how to do it. He's confronted by this big bureaucracy. And at every level of these, you know, some of these are 60,000 people working for these agencies. And at all the sort of higher levels of that bureaucracy, you have individuals who are capable of committing a civil disobedience that will turn off lights somewhere, that will stop the sewage treatment plant, will flood the streets, and that will embarrass the president. So they tiptoe around these agencies and they never do anything about it because they don't know how to do it. But I know how. I know exactly what to do. And I know how to do it at a granular level. Now, when President Trump said he was going to drain the swamp, and he brings John Bolton in, to run the NSA, that is like putting a swamp creature in charge of draining the swamp. He brought Scott Gottlieb and Alex Azar, a pharmaceutical lobbyist. Scott Gottlieb is a business partner of Pfizer. President Trump appoints him to run the FDA, and Scott Gottlieb gets in there, does a $100 billion favor for Pfizer. When it comes and to goes back to Pfizer, goes back to the regulatory capture. capture, I think that even President Trump would admit at this point that he would have to do a much better job in his second term with regard to staffing. But why did he do the second term if he messed it up so badly the first time? He said he was going to do that the first time. If I had been president, I would have done it. He was able, and even when he knew what was wrong, he said, well, I'll never lock down this country. He got rolled by his bureaucrats. I mean, I think that a lot of people who support President Trump, myself included, who believe that he got rolled by his own state. Yeah, he he got by, we need but, somebody in there who will not get rolled by the bureaucrats. This is when my uncle, you know, when my uncle was president um, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, there were 13 people on the XCOM committee who were, you know, living at the White House, including my father, who, who, who got caught at the White House, and we didn't see him for 13 days. Even though we're only 14 minutes from the White House, my, my home at Hickory Hill, my father was there, and Bob McNamara, Dean Acheson, all the great beards from the diplomatic court, um, and, the, and the, you know, Curtis May and, and Louis Lemonster from the Joint Chiefs of Staff, so they were all meeting sometimes 24 hour a day, on and off. And the first time they voted, there was an 11, 13, 11 to 13 vote that we invade Cuba, and we bombed the missile sites. There were 64 Russian missile sites that the Russians had secretly erected there. My uncle said to him, but are, those war, are there warheads on the active warheads on that, those missiles? The CIA didn't know. And my uncle said, are the gun crews Cuban or are they Russian? The CIA said, we don't know, but we think they're Russian. How many people in the gun crews? Up to 600 on each gun crew, 64 gun crews. My uncle said, if we bomb them and kill all those Russians, isn't Khrushchev going to have to come to Berlin? And they said to him, we don't think he has the guts to do that. My uncle said, I'm not going to take that risk. He asked them for the aerial photos, and he examined them himself. He went granular, and then the last day, after the 13th day, this is the 13th most dangerous days in history. There are many times during that period that many of those people believe that they may wake up dead the next morning. This nuclear change would wipe out the East Coast. The last day, my uncle took a vote. And he already knew what he was going to do, the embargo. He said, um, he, he took a vote. He said, this is a final vote. And they voted eight to six to invade. And my uncle said, the six is habit. So he, what he was saying is, I'm listening to you. You're experts. I value your advice. But I'm going to make up my own mind about what's, good, what's best for this country. Unfortunately, President Trump does not have, has shown that he doesn't have that capacity.